My goal here is to do a quick equations review video. Uh, please note that all equations in this video you should have memorized before walking into the test tomorrow. Most of them you should know by now, but if not, this is the last chance to get them in your head. First of all, Ohm's Law. If you're looking for voltage, current, or resistance in a circuit, Ohm's Law is usually the place to go. Ohm's Law is also the basis for VIR charts, which is what you should do if you're in doubt about finding something in a circuit. So if a question asks about voltage, current, or resistance, and you're not sure what to do, VIR charts are the way to get started. Now this is kind of a, like a rare blessing in AP physics. There is a clear path to start pretty much any problem asking for voltage, current, and resistance. You could do VIR. Now, some questions you might be able to see how to get the answer faster than a VIR chart, and that's fine. One little thing I want to add about a VIR chart, if we're discussing a battery that has internal resistance, the way you handle that is you pretend that there's a little R resistor right next to the battery, and then there's the battery itself, which we represent with epsilon. And so whatever else is going on in the circuit goes here, but the battery has a little resistor next to it. And any time a question asks you for a terminal voltage, which it can sometimes ask in roundabout ways, it could say, what is the voltage across the load on the circuit? And that's asking you for the voltage all out here. So this would be the voltmeter measuring that voltage. To find that voltage, the terminal voltage, you take the electromotive force of the battery minus the current through little r. So it would be the current right here times the resistance of little r, the resistance right here. And that will give you the terminal voltage. A question could also ask it kind of sneakily, have this complicated circuit going on out here, whatever, and then tell you there's an internal resistance on the battery, little r. And it might say, what's the voltage between points A and B? Well, notice A and B covers everything except the battery. So that would be the terminal voltage. Terminal voltage is the voltage minus whatever the little r inside the battery takes up. In addition to using VIR, two helpful equations for uh, circuits, the power equation, P equals IV, which if we substitute in from Ohm's law, V is IR, the equation turns into P equals I squared R. Something that kind of concerned me on our power pop quiz, some people were treating power like energy, but power is not energy. Power is measured in watts just like when we did power from way back when. Power is measured in watts, which is joules per second, which is essentially some energy over time. Now, I'm just using E there as the general letter for energy. You haven't seen this equation, or uh, sorry, expression before. But power is an energy over time. So if a question says how much power does a resistor use, you need to just find P equals IV. But if a question says how much energy does a resistor use, you multiply your power by time to get the energy out of it. Okay? Now this is not like an equation I would ask you to know or memorize. It's more about the definition of power. Power, power is an amount of energy per time. So if I have a power and one an energy, I've got to multiply by time. And time is measured in seconds. So like 30 days, you'd have to change into how many ever seconds. All right, went through that fast, but main point, power is calculated with these two equations. Uh, for both of them, notice you need current, so if you don't have current, you'd have to go back to Ohm's Law and solve for it using that. Two things we also dealt with, and I'll draw a little line down the middle to differentiate. We had resistors, and if you want the resistance on a resistor, not put in a circuit, you're just trying to figure out the resistor by itself. Resistance is resistivity times length over cross-sectional area. So the longer a resistor is, so if we have these two cylindrical things, I'm calling them resistors, the longer one would have more resistance, and the smaller one would have less resistance because you have L on top, direct relationship between length and resistance. Cross-sectional areas on the bottom, though, so if I had this resistor and this resistor, the one with the smaller area has more resistance, because areas on cross-sectional areas on the bottom of that fraction, and as you make the area bigger, the fraction itself gets smaller. And this is also what you did with the straws. The straw that was wider was easier to breathe through, had less resistance. The straw that was longer was harder to breathe through, more resistance. 
we also deal with capacitors. Now what's tempting is often to think about this equation giving you capacitance. The only time that equation would tell you capacitance is if you knew the amount of charge and you knew the voltage. So you could figure it out that way. But just because you change a voltage doesn't mean you've changed a capacitance, which is what can make this equation confusing. The capacitance of a capacitor depends only on the plate geometry of the capacitor. The wider the capacitor, sorry, the more area the capacitor has, which just doesn't, doesn't have to be only width, it could be any of the dimensions for determining area. The more area it has, the more capacitance it has. And the smaller the distance between the two plates on the capacitor, the more capacitance it has. So notice if I make D big, capacitance gets small. To change capacitance, you must change one of these things, either the area or the distance, or epsilon naught, which is a constant of the universe, though. It's the permeability of free space, or how easy it is for information to kind of propagate out in free space. It's way beyond what we're doing here. But to alter the capacitor, you've got to change the area or the distance. Once you have a capacitor, once I've gone to Radio Shack and bought one or built one with a certain area and distance between the plates, the capacitance is fixed. And if I change the voltage, that will change the charge. If I change the charge, I must have changed to a different voltage. But I can't actually alter the capacitor by changing one of these two things. To change the capacitor, I have to change the plate geometry, the shape of the plates. One thing that could be tricky, though, if we add a different battery to a circuit, that will change the voltage, and that will therefore change the charge. And think about this. If I'm trying to keep capacitance the same, upping the voltage in order to keep this fraction the same, I have to up the charge. If I decrease the voltage, I have to decrease the charge. Also, if I've got a capacitor hooked up and I change one of these things, that could therefore change charge or voltage. So let's say I cut the area in half. That means I've cut my capacitance in half, which means I must have also cut the charge in half. Because theoretically, we're hooked to a battery and that battery is staying constant, which is what we do. So not just theoretical. Practically, we probably didn't change the battery. All right, now let's talk about equivalence. Equivalence. For resistors and for capacitors. For resistors in series, so R, E, Q in series, you just add the resistances, how many ever you had. For resistors in parallel, remember that adding a resistor in parallel decreases resistance because it's like opening up a new lane at the checkout at Walmart or Safeway or wherever. And so to do that, since everyone added decreases the resistance, we've got to use inverses. So 1 over REQ is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3. Now for capacitors, it's opposite. For equivalent capacitance in series, because you're decreasing the voltage every time you add something for the electrons to fall across. We use inverses to show that every capacitor will decrease the equivalent capacitance. So 1 over C1, 1 over C2, 1 over C3, and so on. For capacitors in parallel, because the voltage is the same for all of them in parallel, you're actually allowing more charge to be stored and thereby increasing the capacitance. You just add them, C1 plus C2 plus C3. Uh, we went over this pretty quickly, so let me make sure you understand. The units for capacitance are farads. Capacitance is measured in farads, given by the units F. One last thing that is definitely going to come up. In a given capacitor, you can have a charge per voltage. If I know the voltage, or have found the voltage by math in the capacitor, I can also find the electric field in that capacitor using the formula E is V over D. So this equation was built for dealing with capacitors. 
If I find the voltage, I can also find the electric field in that capacitor. That's all. Good luck on the test tomorrow.